Fora TV. The world is thinking. Good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting of Inforum, a division of the Commonwealth Club by and for people in their 20s and 30s with a mission to inspire debate on civic issues. You can find us online at commonwealthclub.org forward slash Inforum. I'm Laura Fraser, author of An Italian Affair and a member of the San, Francisco's Writers, San Francisco Writers Grotto. And it's my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's guest, Jonah Lehrer. Lehrer is a scientist, a writer, and an engaging thinker. A Rhodes Scholar, I've been told that Mr. Lehrer can frequently be found lurking around scientific laboratories when he's not writing for such publications as The New Yorker, Nature, Wired, The Washington Post, and The Boston Globe. He is editor-at-large for Seed Magazine, an insightful and entertaining online publication about science. He's also the best-selling author of Proust was a Neuroscientist, and most recently, How We Decide. We're delighted that he's here with us tonight. Please join me now in warmly welcoming Jonah Lehrer to Inform at the Commonwealth Club. So Jonah, I'm going to start with the end of your book, How We Decide, um, because right at the end you said that you wrote this book because you couldn't figure out which kind of Cheerios to buy. So what was going on when, in your brain when you were trying to decide which kinds of Cheerios? <laughs> well, this is, I, I, I got the idea for the book. I can remember the exact morning. Um, my wife and I had recently returned from living overseas, so we were still adjusting to the surreal abundance of the American supermarket, the fact that you have 200 different types of toothpaste, 100 different types of floss. Um, and, and we'd gotten all our food items, and we... We're at the checkout line. We put them on the conveyor belt. And that's when we remember that we'd forgotten to buy breakfast cereal. So I was sent back to the cereal aisle with relatively straightforward instructions to buy a box <laughs> of Cheerios. And no sooner do I get to the cereal aisle than I reach for the box, the yellow box of original Cheerios. Then I spot right next to that the box of Honey Nut Cheerios. And I think to myself, you know, Honey Nut Cheerios are much more delicious than regular Cheerios. So then I reached for the box of Honey Nut Cheerios, only to see right next to that a box of multigrain Cheerios. And I think, you know, I should get more fiber in my diet. So I reached for the box of multigrain Cheerios, only to see that multigrain Cheerios are three ninety nine a box, and that the generic Cheerios are two ninety nine. So I reached for the box of generic Cheerios. I'll, I'll spare the entire interior monologue. But several minutes go by, and I spot my wife out of the corner of my eye looking at me like I've completely lost my mind because I can't pick a box of Cheerios. And so it was, it was very much that failure, that failure of thinking too much, of, of trying to be too rational, coming up with too many reasons that, that first got me interested in the subject. I wanted to know what was happening inside my head as I struggled to make a serial selection, and more importantly, what should have been happening inside my head. Um, and, and so that led me into uh, this subject of decision-making and all this new research which has just come out in the last couple of years. Did you go with the original Cheerios? Oh, gosh, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a complicated question. What I do now, and I probably shouldn't give away my secret at the beginning of the interview, is I mix Honey Nut Cheerios and Multigrain Cheerios in the same bowl. Um, so that's, that's my secret recipe for decision-making. Now, do you think our consumer culture with this enormous abundance of choices is making decision-making more difficult for us and it's making us crazy? I do. I mean, I mean this, is, this is relatively, this is it's often referred to as the paradox of choice. And there are some interesting studies that show, for example, there's actually an experiment done in a fancy grocery store in Menlo Park. And what they found was that when you give consumers three jam options to taste from, so they can sample strawberry jam, blueberry jam, and raspberry jam, about a third of the customers who try one of the jams will buy one of those jams. They'll find their favorite jam and pick one up. However, if you give them 25 different jam options to taste, to select from, so now you're getting all obscure, you're talking about apricot, blueberry jam, pomegranate, molasses jam, whatever, <laughs> now only 3% of consumers will stop and buy a jam. So I think it's a very clear case of how more choices, you know, if you were a 
if you're a microeconomist, you'd assume that more choices would lead to more consumer satisfaction. And yet some part of our brain, there's some initial brain scanning evidence to confirm this, some part of our brain is actually gets scared by all these options that seem equivalent. You can actually see the amygdala, which is a brain area that's often associated with aversive feelings, turn on when people are confronted with options that at first glance seem identical, seem equivalent. And so it's that feeling of uncertainty, the uncertainty of not knowing which cereal to buy or not knowing which jam to buy. That's not a nice feeling. I remember seeing a toddler at the playground once with her parents, and they were saying, Monica, do you want to go on the swing? Monica, do you want to go over here? Monica, do you? And they gave her a thousand choices, yeah. and she just burst into tears. Yeah. I mean, that that's, that's, sounds like what I felt like whenever <laughs> I have to buy toothpaste. Um, now, you say in your book that um, decision-making isn't really what we think it is, that most of us tend to think that either we make rational decisions or we go with our gut. And you're saying that new science um, about the brain is showing us that it's more of like a conversation between those different parts of your brain or perhaps between several different parts of your brain. And I'm wondering if you can just tell us a little bit about, just to get us oriented, what goes on in different parts of the brain and how you know we make decisions where. Sure. Um, so we can start with the very everyday example, a shopping decision choosing to buy, you know, an iPod or a red cashmere sweater. And so when you give people these shopping decisions in a brain scanner, what you see is that you show them the iPod or the cashmere sweater and a brain area called the nucleus accumbens is turned on. This is a brain area that's often associated with pleasurable feelings, the feelings of reward. It's linked to the dopamine reward pathway. That's why you feel nice. You think about how good you look in the cashmere sweater or how much fun you'll have with your iPod. You feel happy. It makes you want that object. But then you show people the price tag, that the iPod costs $1.99 and the cashmere sweater is expensive. You see a brain area called the insula turn on. The insula is often associated with aversive feelings, things like bodily pain, disgust, loss, and it turns out paying for stuff. And so there's this emotional <laughs> tug of war that, that goes on whenever you make a shopping decision. And when you put people in a brain scanner and you ask them whether or not they want to buy the new George Foreman grill, you can predict what they'll choose to buy before they actually make a decision depending on you know, the, these various levels of activation. So that kind of shows, I think illustrates very neatly the, the kind of argument that takes place inside our head, this, this tug of war whenever we make a decision. And one, I think, interesting quirk about these shopping decisions is that when you pay with a credit card, the insula is less active than normal. Because credit cards abstract the transaction, because you're not literally taking cash out of your wallet, you're just swiping this plastic card and the charge will show up on your bill in 30 days, the insula doesn't quite understand what's going on. So it doesn't fully process the pain of paying. And that, that's why I think many scientists argue people spend so much money on the credit card. There's a great experiment I talk about in the book. And that's why many finance investment counselors, finance counselors suggest that you cut up your credit cards. Or, or put them in a block of ice in your freezer. Yeah. Um, do something. I mean, I mean, you know, I think there's lots of evidence that suggests that people buy stuff with their credit cards that they wouldn't normally buy. And there's, there's an experiment done by MIT economists where they had people bid at an auction for Boston Celtics tickets. One group could bid with cash, one group had to bid with their credit cards. And what they found was that the group that bid with credit cards ended up bidding twice as much money for the same tickets as the group that bid with cash. And it gets back to the insula. It, it just doesn't process the pain of paying when you pay with a credit card. Now, throughout your book, you sort of give us a lot of different examples about when you use different parts of your brain and when that's useful. So um, one of the, the things that you talked about was really using your rational part of your brain and, and how that can save you in circumstances. And I'm wondering if you would tell this story about the firefighter who just, you know, instead of reacting to a fire coming his way with, with fear and heading for the hills, just sat down and thought about it for a second and saved his life. Sure. This is, this is a story of Wag Dodge and the Man Gulch Fire. Um, this was a fire in Montana in the early 50s. It was a very deadly prairie fire. And the smoke jumpers, there were 13 of them, they were parachuted into this fire. And when they left Missoula, Montana, they were told it was just a small fire, just a few burning acres. By the time they got there, though, the prairie fire had spread. And they were dropped off in the Man Gulch, which is where the Rocky Mountains essentially meet the Great Plains. So it's a very uneven ter terrain. It's full of these very, very steep gulches, extremely steep grades. 
It's by the time the smoke jumpers arrive, gathered together their equipment, their shovels, their radios. Matt Wag Dodge, who's the smoke jumper in charge, realizes that the fire has gotten out of control, and so he orders his men to proceed down one side of this very steep gulch towards the Missouri River. He wants to be near water. He knows that near water is where it'll be safe in case the fire crowns, in case it gets even bigger. So the men start marching down this very, very steep gulch towards the river when, because it's five o'clock, this is when the twilight winds shift. And so the winds shift. And so the fire, these burning hot embers, all of a sudden change direction and now blow straight across the river, land on the side of the gulch that the men are on. So they're almost towards the river, but now the grass right between them and the river suddenly bursts into flames. Now because heat moves uphill, fires accelerate going uphill. That's, that's, that's a dangerous thing about fighting prairie fires on a steep gulch. So the men, as soon as they see the fire cross the river, they drop all their stuff and they start running up this very steep grade. Now the fire is blown up. It's got this, you know, it's midsummer, so the tall, tall grass, it's eight feet tall grass, is just burnt and dry. It explodes into flame. The flames are, according to some estimates, 200 feet tall. The fire is so hot it's melting the rock. It's 2,000 degrees. The flames start moving up this steep slope at 30 miles per hour. The men, meanwhile, are just trying to race up this hill as fast as they can. At this point, after about 30 seconds of running, the wag dodge realizes, he looks over his shoulder and realizes there's no way the men are going to outrun this fire that it's only a matter of time before they're all burned alive. So Wag Dodge stops running. He yells at his men to stop running. Now, I think it's important to note that I think the most basic instinct we all have when we're being chased by fire is to run, right? I mean, it's, you're being chased by a wall of flame. You want to run. That's, that's your amygdala turning on and saying, get the hell out of here. This is, you're going to die. Run, run, run. Wag Dodge was able to realize that his fear was leading him nowhere, that this feeling of fear he had, this basic instinct, was actually going to kill him. So he ordered his men to stand still. None of his men stood still. They thought he was committing suicide. But Wag Dodge, in this most harrowing of moments, came up, had a moment of insight, came up with an escape plan. And this is what's now known as, as the escape fire. He got out the box of matches in his pocket, lit a match, lit the ground right in front of him, watched as the fire spread away, and then lay down in this burned patch of grass. Because fire can burn what's already been burnt, he just lay down there, wet his, can wet his handkerchief with some water from his canteen, clutched it to his mouth, and waited for the fire to pass over him. That's, that's how the escape fire, which is now a very common firefighting technique, was invented in this most harrowing of moments. And then what that illustrates is... It's, you know, your emotional brain can be profoundly intelligent, can be profoundly wise, can, can often shock us with how much it knows, because it knows more than we know. And yet at the same time, it can also lead us in the wrong direction. So that's why it's so important to, when you're running from a fire, or in the case of Captain Sullenberger, when you're, you know, lost total engine power over New York City, why it's important to ask your emotional brain a question and, and to see if it's actually being helpful or if it's leading you, you know, to run up a hill when you can't outrun a fire. Now, can you give us an example of kind of the opposite when you don't want to let your rational brain um, overthink when you kind of want to check in more with your um, emotional brain? Or, or just, I guess you don't really check in with your emotional brain. It just goes. But when is overthinking a bad idea? Well, well, so in the case of Wag Dodge or Captain Sullenberger, what you see in the brain is the prefrontal cortex turns on. This is a uniquely human brain area. It's greatly enlarged during human evolution. And it allows us to kind of rebut our emotions, to think through fear and make sure our fear doesn't turn into panic. So, you know, everyone on the U.S. Airways flight is terrified. Everyone's scared. And yet because Captain Sullenberger has this prefrontal cortex and because he's practiced thinking through fear, and pilots call this deliberate calm because staying calm requires deliberate effort, he was able to make a decision based on the facts, based on his altitude and airspeed, based on how far away Teterboro, New Jersey is, stuff like that. So the prefrontal cortex is what allows you to be rational to make these considered deliberate decisions. Now, in terms of why sometimes the prefrontal cortex can backfire, this gets back to the sheer computational limitations of the prefrontal cortex. It's a magnificent piece of machinery. It's what allows Wag Dodge to invent the escape fire, and yet it can only handle about seven pieces of information 
plus or minus two at any given moment. You give them more than that and you short, start to short circuit it. So That's one of the, why too many cereal decisions. Yes, ex exactly. Why, why, why when there are 20 different kinds of Cheerios, why can't I can't make up my mind? And yeah. so one of the experiments I talk about in the book um, was done by a Stanford psychology professor who he had two